evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, tonight's presentation uh, of The Lost Boys of Montauk with author Amanda M. Fairbanks. We'd like to thank uh, Amanda Fairbanks and Henry Osmers, who is the uh, tour director of the Montauk Lighthouse. Uh, we'd like to thank them for being with us tonight to do this, uh, this discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the East End Libraries that are on the talk tonight. And I will mention um, the libraries on the talk this evening. We have participants from Mattatuck, uh, the Quag Library, the Hampton Bays Library, Floyd Memorial Library, Port Jefferson Free Library, and the North Shore Public Library and the Deer Park Public Library. Um, if you have any questions this evening, uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat. Um, we can acknowledge the questions during the Q&A period. If you'd like to use the raise hand feature uh, during that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and we will get to your question. I just would like to uh, say a few words before we begin. Uh, Amanda Fairbanks is a journalist who has worked in the editorial department of the New York Times and as a reporter for the Huffington Post and at our local East Hampton Star, where she wrote investigative stories, features, and profiles. Her writing has also appeared in the Boston Globe, Newsweek, The Atlantic, and the San Francisco Chronicle. She's a graduate of Smith College and a former uh, Teach for America Corps member. She has two master's degrees from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism and currently is residing in Sag Harbor. Henry Osmers, uh, he was born in Brooklyn, New York and has worked as tour director for the Montauk Lighthouse and historian for the past 20 years, since 2001, where he's entertained visitors with tales of its exciting history. He's also the author of a few books, including On Eagle's Beat, A History of Montauk Point Lighthouse, and Living on the Edge, Life at the Montauk Point Lighthouse from 1930 to 1940. So without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Amanda Fairbanks and Henry Osmers. Thank you so much, uh, Steve, for making this possible. And to everyone joining us from all over Long Island, it is just such a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you for making the time on your, your Friday evening uh, to join us. And thank you very much. Uh, I represent uh, the Montauk Lighthouse, as Steve said, and uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, Amanda this evening. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it tells a, a great story, a tragic story of uh, four men who from diverse backgrounds came together and uh, kind of went off into eternity. It was, uh, it, well, well, we'll get into it a little more in depth when we start the questioning. Uh, Amanda, first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I'd like to just begin by asking you, uh, when did you first hear about the story of this boat, the Windblown, which uh, went down in 1984 and uh, took the lives of four fishermen, uh, Captain Mike Stednick and his three crew members, Dave Connick, Michael Vigilant, and Scott Clark? That's right. Henry, it's a pleasure to see you in person. We've only ever corresponded by email, so this is a real treat. Um, just to note, it was it was Captain Michael Stedman. Just just to be clear, um, did, did I say Stedman? Uh, I think you said. I think that you didn't quite say Stedman. Some. Oh, this, okay. Was, I'm, I understand. Yeah. No. No problem at all. Um, so I, as you know, am a, a, a reporter and journalist, and uh, the story actually started taking shape when I was a staff writer at the East Hampton Star, which is a, one of the last remaining small family owned newspapers, um, which we're very fortunate to have an abundance of here on the East End, but that's certainly not the case in many small towns across America. And I was nearing the end of my tenure there when a new editor had joined the staff, um, a man by the name of Biddle Duke. 
And he was just getting ready to launch um, a magazine called East. And we were sitting upstairs. It was a February morning and we were becoming acquainted with one another. And he started uh, telling me, we're brainstorming story ideas and what have you. And it was during this particular conversation that he first told me the story of the windblown. And he said, you know, it's one of this, this kind of great untold stories that's never really been told in the kind of depth and richness it so deserves. And uh, during the same conversation, he introduced me to a woman by the name of Mary Steadman, who is, who was, and is at the time, she was a very young widow uh, with three little boys um, on March 29th, 1984, uh, the day that her husband was supposed to come home from a week long trip of catching tilefish. And at the time, you know, Biddle was going on and on about Mary and these men. And, and I said, well, this has clearly struck a nerve. Why is it that you don't want to write the story? Um, you know, you seem better equipped than, than most. Um, and he said, well, you know, I've long, I've long thought about telling the story and sort of wrestled with it. But it turns out he had grown up with one of the young uh, crew members, uh, Dave Connick, who, who, who you had mentioned at the outset. And he said that, you know, it really required an outsider to come to this story um, rather than an insider, that, that sort of a, a fresh perspective and to be, hold it, to be beholden to not necessarily one particular perspective. So it sort of started out like that. And I started interviewing Mary and I, you know, tens of thousands of interview notes started to accumulate. And I realized that this wasn't just a simple um, magazine story I had on my hands, but the beginnings of a book. Um, and this was back in the fall, the fall of 2017, actually. I took a trip, a reporting trip. Um, we were living in California at the time, and I took a trip to your incredible lighthouse. Um, and we can talk about it later, but I had a very particular moment at that lighthouse where it was sort of like the universe was conspiring and telling me that, that not only was this a book, but that I should be the one uh, to tell it. So we can talk about that later. All right. Uh, did you originally set up with the intent of solving a mystery of what happened, where and when the boat went down? Did you have a sense that there would be maybe several different stories to tell that in the end would make would take you far beyond what happened to these men and the boat? So that's interesting. You know, I, I when I when I first conceived of the story, I certainly knew that story of the four men who were who were lost on this boat. Um, but as you know, another year and a half went by of reporting and interviews, I interviewed more than 100 people for this book, and many of whom I interviewed for dozens of hours at a time at several different instances, of course. Um, and as I dove deeper into the story, I realized that there were all of these many just truly to me fascinating layers. Um, and in that way, it also became sort of an obsession of, of learning about all of these worlds that were totally unknown to me at the time. Um, but no, I, I never, you know, presumed that I would like go out diving and find um, the whole of the boat. <laughs> Although, um, on that note, uh, it's been interesting. A, a, a young um, obsessive shipwreck, shipwreck hunter has recently been in touch. And he and a group of men on Long Island, you know, that that sort of again, they've looked for shipwrecks from like the last few few centuries, um, are very keen to go out diving later this summer uh, to see if they can possibly um, find what what was the hole of the wind blown. So we'll see. I asked that I could please possibly accompany them if they make such a dive, um, but I'll, but I'll keep you posted. Sounds like the proverbial needle in a haystack, I guess, but. Uh... You never know, yeah. maybe, maybe something will turn up. Uh, Thank you, though, these men, you know, it was so interesting. So when they were coming in off of this tile fishing trip, it was, of course, as you know, this terrible nor'easter, uh, yeah. devastating storm. But, you know, it's not as though they were hundreds of miles from the point. The last radio contact that Captain Stedman made was just about a dozen miles away. So in that way, um, you know, the, the folks that are hunting for it, it's not as though they're, they're traversing hundreds of miles of, of a radius and what have you. It's, it's, you know, relatively close to the point than some of the other shipwrecks of their time. Right. Uh, when I was reading the book, I was, I, <laughs> I got to admit, I was taken with uh, one, the chapter on uh, Mahoneyville. Mm. <laughs> and it seemed like that's a place where boys could be boys. And... Uh, do you think that kind of a place exists today? You know, um, 
no, not not in the, quite the same way. Um, it was sort of this this kind of dazed and confused uh, compound. Uh, it was south of the highway. It was a you know very very close to Georgia Beach, and it was owned by the Mahoneyville family, who had a whole bunch of sons. And um, you know over time they had kind of taken over the barn and turned it into this kind of surfing, uh, really kind of cool hippie uh, hangout. They listened to a lot of reggae. Uh, they smoked a lot of pot. They, you know, had sex with their girlfriends or, or not their girlfriends. Um, it was sort of a testosterone fueled um, extravaganza. And it was, it was uh, and boys no, being boys. <laughs> it was boys being boys. Yes. Um, I also interviewed some of the young women who intersected at Mahoneyville, and some of them had less fond memories of their time there. Um, it was a complicated moment for them. Yeah, I think they were all on the precipice of sort of becoming adults and figuring out, you know, what it was they would do with their lives. But this was a place that I think forever in their mind's eye was was part of their carefree, um, their carefree youth and adolescence and, and really their coming of age. I, 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 re I recall in connection with Mahoneyville, uh, I think it was uh, Alice Connick, who in particular was really not fond of his of her son going there. She was not such a fan of Mahoneyville, no. Uh, and it was sort of interesting because it's, it's very, very close to the Maidstone Club, which, uh, which is a private members only, extremely expensive, uh, predominantly white uh, privileged uh, club. You know, it's within walking distance mm -hmm. essentially just down, the, down the road. And, you know, it was sort of a, fa a fascinating counterpoint because this was very much removed from the, the kind of preppy buttoned up part of East Hampton where their parents, many of these boys, their parents were Maidstone Club members and would be socializing there. And just as you say, you know, Alice would pull up and, and feel like, you know, her son Dave was kind of going off the rails and was, you know, experimenting with different types of hallucinogenic drugs and just leading a totally different lifestyle than she had experienced in her generation. Um, and one of the really interesting parts of it for me uh, since I obviously didn't grow up in that era, was this sort of generational conflict, right? So it was this, you know, a lot of the, the, the baby boomers and the, you know, the World War II vets um, who maybe had um, just a really different experience of what their adolescence had been like. And then suddenly they gave birth and raised these kids that were, you know, experimenting with drugs that didn't exist during their adolescence. And I think it was, it was quite difficult actually to find, to find that common ground. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you mentioned in the book too that you were you you found that it was relatively uh, easy to get information on Stedman, Connick, and Vigilant, but not so much for Scott Clark. Uh, why was it harder to find information on his background? So Scott will forever just sort of, I think, I mean, all four of the men will live in my mind's eye forever. Um, but I felt as though I had a much clearer sense of who the other three had been than I have of Scott. You know, it was sort of this, the situation where, you know, he was all of 18 years old. He had dropped out of high school. He had grown up in Oceanside. He had a single mother and he, you know, dropped out of school to become a commercial fisherman. And he was relatively new to Montauk at the time. And it just became so interesting, you know, Obviously, this was this occurred in '84, and this was, you know, almost 40 years later that I started gathering all of this material. So by that point, his mother had passed away, and his stepfather was no longer living, and so I kind of got a lot of his family history through a first cousin. Um, but it became a, yet another indication of just sort of how quickly our histories can evaporate from a place. You know, if if there isn't like a written there's a sort of a stack of written correspondence or um, like the Stedman, the Stedman history was so rich uh, for many reasons, but partly because two of the patriarchs, um, both Bruce, Mike's father and Alfred, his grandfather had written down their histories and shared them uh, with their families. And so I never had that with Scott. Um, and, and I only came, you know, sort of second and third hand. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many time, how many phone calls and emails I tried to send to possible girlfriends of his, you know, going back to high school and, and what have you. And it became, eventually I had to, you know, write the book that I wrote. Um, but yeah, I will forever wonder um, about who he really was in, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, I, I was particularly intrigued by the, uh, 
comments that uh, Mary Stedman and Alice, Alice uh, Connick made, uh, they kind of stood out in my mind. Uh, what was it like for you, like when you met with these two? What were those interviews like? Mm. So Mary, I, I, I met with and interviewed on a number of different occasions, both in person and on the telephone. Um, and Alice actually, uh, she unfortunately passed away uh, just last fall. And I was thankful to be able to sit down with her. And I only had one, one interview with her, uh, was sort of a late morning to early afternoon. We spent a few hours together. Um, and I remember being very nervous. I was here for the anniversary to meet with many of the family members and the survivors. And I remember driving there that morning, um, feeling quite nervous that I was about to meet Dave's mother. And I, you know, I was soon heading back to California and we would have this, this moment together and then we wouldn't. So, um, you know, that's part of the work that I do obviously is interviewing people and hopefully, uh, you know, sometimes connecting with them and drawing them out. But it was a it was a very moving interview talking with Alice about her son and 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 really I think you know even though it was nearing the very end of her life she had quite late stage Parkinson's at that point um, you know she really felt as though this was an avoidable tragedy and that she she really wished uh, that she had been able to more forcibly remove her son from you know this this love of of the ocean of the sea of fishing of surfing of of all the reasons. Um, that he ended up on that boat. And, and just one more thing is that as obviously as a, you know, typically historically anyway, many sea stories have been written and are written mostly predominantly by men. And, um, you know, one of the pieces of this for me as, as obviously a, a woman writer was that it was the story of the women who were left behind. Um, that obviously the tragedy occurred at sea, um, but I became, as fascinated by the survivors who were left to piece together their life, whether it was through Mary, the widow, or it was through Alice, the mother, or Kim and Catherine, the girlfriends, and you know, just just how it is that that this tragedy would exert this force, um, and it would impact each of them differently. But it was it was you know they they were forever altered as a consequence. Each of those women in different ways, and that that became endlessly fascinating to me. Wow. Uh, uh I, I met uh, Mary uh, a couple of times, but uh, the one I met most often was Alice Connick. And mm. she would come up uh, every year to visit the monument. And we'd bring her up in the golf cart, especially in those last years when she was really not able to be very mobile and the Parkinson's had really set in. And it, it never failed to uh, impress me how she would struggle to get out of the golf cart because right near the monument and she would make her way over to that statue and her feeble hand would just reach out, just touch his name. Mm. And just to watch that, it was just, it was just such a moving experience just at that moment. And you, you can only imagine what the, what the thoughts that were running through her mind. Yes, yes. Um, for those those listening and watching at home, you know this this monument is is absolutely worth making a trip out to the lighthouse to go and visit. Um, as Henry will tell you, um, it's just this incredible testament to all of these men, and it's all men who have obviously. Um, lost their lives to the sea going back. What is the first year on the on the monument? Uh, it's 1719 it goes back to. 1719, and there right. Are, there are about 120 names on there. Uh, and actually, there, uh, there are a couple of women, believe it or not. Uh, are there really? Uh, wow. Yeah, there are a couple. Uh, in uh, the hurricane of 1938, there were a number of people who were swept away in a tidal wave. And one of them, I believe her name was Vivian Field. Don't ask me why I remember, but I do. Uh, these people just simply vanished in that uh, terrible hurricane. So, wow. yeah, it's, it, yeah, the, there's about 120 names on there that may go right, they're in chronological order. Uh, the names of the people are there, the dates, and if the ages of the people are known, they are indicated also. Mm. Uh, now, I, I, the I next remember the first time I visited one, one thing that it, it is so incredibly moving um, 
you know, as a complete outsider to the story, I'll never forget walking up to the monument for that first time. And obviously I had read the news clips of these four men, but there's just something about seeing their names etched in that granite, you know, with this whole long history of, of brotherhood lost to the sea that is, it, it's an incredibly moving spot um, to, to go and visit. Um, and well, one yeah. other thing is that Alice actually we spoke a bit about, about you know, she, was, she was very involved with the sculptor, Malcolm Fraser, who, who made the yeah. monument. And, um, you know, Alice was an artist herself. She was a painter. And I think the two of them really connected around the artistic process. And I think for Alice, obviously, there's, there is actually um, a, a gravestone for her son at their family pl uh, plot in East Hampton. But obviously, there's nothing beneath the, the gravestone. But this became, even though, it, you know, the memorial went up quite a few years after her son had been lost at sea, there was just something, I, I think, you know, probably related to the, to the lack of closure for all of these families, that there was a place for them to go and mourn their lost ones. And, um, and she was very moved by it. It was, it was really a, a, a very, very special spot for her, a holy spot, I would say. Well, I think the word I keep using for visitors who come to the lighthouse and they go to see that memorial is tangible that it's something mm. that they can reach out and they can actually touch. And, and they, I guess then they realize that's the closest they're going to get to this person who was gone. But to me, it, it just is so powerful uh, to, to have that there. And for the average visitor who has no idea what it is, if I'm out there, I'll explain that story and tell them. And uh, suddenly their whole attitude changes and uh, suddenly they become very reverent. Mm, yeah, no, it's a beautiful spot. Very moving. Uh, next thing I was gonna ask you, and I can relate to this myself. Uh, you said, uh, you mentioned yourself as being an outsider. And uh, I've worked at the Lighthouse for 21 years and I, I commute from a, a 60 mile distance. So I've been an outsider for a long time. And uh, I've written a few books about Montauk and the Lighthouse. Uh, and I always found that, I guess, thinking about it as an outsider, for me, I felt that it was good to be able to write about different subjects in Montauk, uh, so I would not be biased in any way because I was an outsider. Uh, was, do you, did you feel similar when you wrote this book? Was that a very important thing to you? I did. I did. Um, I think there are advantages and disadvantages to being insiders and outsiders about stories. I mean, obviously, journalists are, are frequently um, outsiders to the to the stories that we tell. Um, I think for me, you know, I wanted the reason that I'm, I'm I'm in the book. I'm obviously a very minor character in the book, but I wanted to explain to the reader, you know, why it was that I how it was that I discovered this book, why it became an obsession. Um, how, you know, a, a person coming into a narrative uh, to tell it, you know, changes that version, right? Each of these people, each of these family members would have written entirely different histories than, than the story that I've written. Um, and mine is obviously a compilation of all these different accounts and perspectives. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, I think, coming, coming to these stories. And I think also I have such reverence and love for this place. Uh, even though I obviously didn't grow up here and I'll never be able to say that I'm from here, <laughs> no matter how long I stay here. Um, coming from Los Angeles, which is so funny because if you show up kind of a week ago, you can say that you're from there. But anyway, it's just so funny that how different the two, the two places are, which is why this place very much resonates with me. But also I think you know, New Yorkers and Long Islanders are just, um, they're so authentic and they really let you in and they're such, good for the most part, uh, really good people. And the fishermen in particular, I, I just have such respect for the work that they do. And obviously I came to this with, you know, I knew nothing about, about commercial fishing or surfing or, or golden tile fish or grief and loss and trauma, all these different things became, you know, sort of subtopics to explore. But the fishing piece was like, I had to get that right. And um, I just can't, you know, get, interviewing those fishermen was, was just such a fun part of, of this process. Well, I think there's a regular brotherhood with the fishermen. Truly. Uh, and truly. I think you even mentioned yeah. it in your book that uh, once the report came in that the ship had been uh, lost, they presumed that uh, 
it wasn't just uh, official organizations like the Coast Guard that went out. These fishermen went out in their own boats and did uh, a fair degree of searching on their own looking for these men. The entire so, fleet went back out. Yeah, yeah it, it's... Uh, there's definitely there's definitely a kinship among these these people, and you, and you can understand that. So when we tell people, like even on the even on a beautiful day, when they go out fishing, you never know what's going to happen. There was a story years ago of a, a fisherman who went out on a beautiful sunny calm day, and drowned because when he threw the anchor overboard, the line got caught around his leg and pulled him under. Mm. So. Even on a even on a beautiful day, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, Truly, do, do you, when you when you're interviewing like Mary and Alice and all these other people, the boyfriend, the the, the girlfriends rather, and uh, yeah, yeah, did, yeah. Did you find that people generally were cooperative with you when you uh, interviewed them? I did. I did. Yeah. I would say, of the, let's say, hundred and twenty people. I interviewed or thereabouts. Um, maybe there were two or three that didn't really want to talk. Um, you know, uh, but for the most part, no, everyone was incredibly forthcoming and and you know welcomed me in. Um, and and obviously certain people I spoke to very briefly for you know certain certain ancillary details and what have you. But um, but no, for for the vast majority, they they were hugely cooperative, and I, I obviously couldn't have written the book without without their um their cooperation oh that's great uh not the few yeah. that didn't was it just that the emotions were just too raw for them or even after all these years uh, or they just just didn't want to talk about it period you know i i think that i think that's true it was interesting so uh let's so for, we've, sp we've spoken about scott clark so michael vigilant obviously as you know his father had had uh had died at sea a few years prior Yes. And, you know, when he died, he left behind Maud, his wife, and, and they had three sons. And so it was interesting to piece together Michael's history because I only ever communicated, I mean, again, this is over the course of three years, I, hundreds of emails we must have exchanged. Um, but his sister, Linda, would, who was an incredible source and, you know, read different drafts of the chapters uh, about her brother, you know, over and over again. And we would make small changes and large changes until she felt comfortable. But she actually never wanted, she neither wanted to meet uh, in person, which I, I offered multiple times to fly down to Florida to interview her um, or talk on the telephone. So that became another history that I had to kind of glean through email, which as you know, is a medium that is, you know, it's, there's a lot that, that, that gets left out, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, sitting down with someone and speaking with them face to face. Um, so that became an interesting, you know, version of, of him. And then obviously I reached out to different friends of his and what have you. Um, but yeah, that, 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 was, that was certainly an interesting uh, way that that evolved that I couldn't have certainly predicted uh, at the outset. <laughs> Uh, I got to admit, when I was reading about uh, the chapter about uh, Mahoneyville and uh, the escapades of uh, Mike Stedman and David Connick, I, I, I couldn't help rooting for them, you know, mm. as far as shaking off that yoke of the high society ways, you know, and, and yeah. there was more of a rough and tumble way of, of living. Uh, the, now, did, did you find yourself in that kind of a position or did, did, did you, were you kind of rooting for them yourself or did you just kind of distance oh, yourself from them? I was absolutely, I mean, they're the heroes of the story, uh, Mike and Dave, uh, for me, you know, um, last evening someone had asked me who, you know, who from the book that's no longer living, could I sit down, would I love to sit down and, and meet? Obviously it would be Mike and it would be Dave. Um, what courage they had, you know, to to blaze their own path and, um, you know, to have been missed, maybe brought up in one particular circumstance and um, and decided to go in a wholly different one. Certainly that's the case for Dave Connick. And, you know, another friend read it recently and she said, you know, it's obviously a very sad story and it is, it's, it's a heavy story. But um, what would have been truly tragic, she said, was if Mike and Dave had become stockbrokers or corporate lawyers or whatever it was that their fathers had wanted them to do. And they would have been miserable at those jobs, right? But they had the courage and the conviction 
to follow their hearts and what it was that they love to do most in the world. Um, and there's just something so beautiful and inspiring about that. And I think we can all relate to that universality of, of connecting yeah. with that thing that you love to do and, and then to have the courage to follow that. So um, no, I just, I have such respect for the two of them. I really do. Kind of like being free spirits. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is this is something I thought about myself is that you know when someone dies, uh, everybody grieves in their own way. I don't think there's any two people that can grieve the same way. Uh, did any of the people that were in their lives uh, when they heard the news, did any of their ways of responding to this loss uh, seem especially emotional or extreme? Mm, you mean at the time or, or when, once yeah. I heard them? Yeah, at the oh. time when they first heard and then actually even carrying it forward. Because uh, some of them seem to have been carrying this for a long, long time. I mean, nobody, time. Ever, nobody could ever forget something like this, but it's how you deal with it. Right, 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 right. Um, you know, I think just as we were discussing, I think that the lack of closure in this story that the, you know, they, the rescuers found pieces of the boat and they found a shoe and they found this and they found that, but obviously they never found the men and they never found the whole of the boat. And I think that, you know, survivors, we need that closure. We need a body and we need a period at the end of a sentence and, and to kind of process what, what has just occurred. Um, and that, that la you know, the disappearance factor of this story, I think, really cannot be overstated and what that would do to the survivors. There was a, you know, one, one man who was supposed to be on the wind loan, um, Tom McGivern, and, and, you know, his brother had shared with me that, that all of March is, is like a really tricky time still for him. And he kind of like, you know, has these different outbursts and, you know, part of it is conscious, part of it is unconscious. Like, it's just like a month that he associates with deep, deep loss and grief. Um, and, and, and Scott's, Scott Clark's mother, interestingly, Donna, you know, she went to her grave believing that her son was still alive. And there yeah. was this kind of magical thinking component that took over that, you know, they had been shipwrecked and then they had, you know, her son had, had had total amnesia and he had gone off you know, to South America or what have you, wherever he had wound up and he had created a whole new life for himself. So she actually so, spent her life tra right, traveling around, which was so fascinating. This woman who had worked at TWA and had all of these airline miles when she had a vacation, she would go and, you know, put up missing posters of her son, which as a mother, I mean, I just, you know, it's, it's unimaginable how you, how you, how you deal with that loss and, and for all of these family members of what, what that means and, and, and what that does to a person. So that was, yeah, it was, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating how, hum as you know, we were coming out of this year of quarantine, 15 months and counting of quarantine, and we've all felt this sense of, of loss, whether it's impacted us personally or peripherally. Um, but we see it does different things to, to all of us, right? It's, it's, it's quite fascinating, the human condition. How, how did your family do with the quarantine, by the way? Were you all good? Uh, uh, we're all okay. Thank you for asking. Yes, I'm very grateful to have my vaccines and to see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's been obviously a very strange time for, um, for all of us. Good. How have you been? We were good. We were fortunate, too. We, uh, we got our vaccines when we were supposed to. and. Uh, I knew a couple of people who got sick, but fortunately we didn't lose anyone. So that's good. Good, good, yes. Uh, to finish up, uh, there, there, was, there were some questions you had suggested, which were, I, I really like these. I think you referred to them as the lightning round. <laughs> I, I like that. Uh, but they, they, they actually made me do some thinking because uh, in my writing, uh, I was, I was answering, trying to answer these questions myself to see you know, how I would fit into this. Uh, uh, shall I ask you the question, Henry? Yeah. I'm more than happy to turn the table. <laughs> well, maybe we could kind of compare notes here a little bit. Uh, okay, very good. Yeah, uh, like your first question, you say, you, did you have any kind of uh, rituals, like before, after, or when you would sit down to write, you know? Did you go through mm -hmm. a, a process? So I used to be, um, you know, before I had children and what have you, I used to be very fussy about where I would write and how I would write. And obviously now at this stage of my life, I'm just grateful for quiet and, you know, 
I'm alone and I can write most anywhere. But um, this was a very intense book to report and to write. And it was very, very heavy. And um, it was conversation after conversation with you know, men that were breaking down. And, and, and some of that would carry into to my life too. I couldn't help but not feel those things. So um, when I would finish writing or a particularly difficult part of writing, um, I've had a I've long time had a long meditation practice. And so I would just make sure to kind of carve out, even if it was just five minutes, to you know, sort of stop thinking about the, the the story I'm telling, and you know, before I go make dinner for my kids or do another load of laundry or pick them up from school or what have you, just to kind of reorient myself back into my own life. Um, this became a story that really it became an obsession, and it really immersed me on so many different levels. And so it, I found myself just needing to establish a boundary, or else I would have been consumed by it pretty much all of the time. If that makes sense. Well with that kind of passion though that you seem to exhibit that would to me that make that would make you a good writer because you're going to you, you're going to put your whole self into this project and you're not going to leave a stone unturned this is true that, <laughs> that's very significant it's either the best part of me or the worst part of me henry the, the, jury, the jury is still out <laughs> how about you do you have any sorry do you have any rituals with your writing and things that you uh, do or don't do? Well, I would just come down to my to the computer room, which is where I am now, uh, and okay. uh, just kind of immerse myself into what I was going to do. I mean, meanwhile, before I even got down here, I mean, my mind was already racing with uh, a number of sources that I wanted to check, people I wanted to call. Uh, it was like my mind could not stop running. And finally, when I would get down here, I would try to spill all that onto paper uh, before nice. I forget, you know. Uh, so yeah. I, I, did, I did five books about Montauk and each one of them was just as much fun to do. But I think as I went through them, I found it easier to do the subsequent ones because I had already been through the process the first time. Yes, yes. I, I think but, I gathered enough material for three books on this topic so for my next project I probably won't go to the ends of the earth in terms of my reporting necessarily well I just think you know thank god for the internet that we have that because if we didn't oh. use it oh, we'd be running to the library every every day and uh putting but stuff in the mail waiting for answers I have to think the like you know Andrea on this on this zoom call I mean I can't tell you how incredible she was. I would email her in the morning saying, I need you know, this story from the archive and within an hour, it would be sitting in my inbox. So I just, I literally couldn't have done parts of this book without their and her particular cooperation and, and help. So uh, thank you to I our like library and our librarians, <laughs> yes. I like this other question here. Did you have a favorite go-to snack or drink when you were writing? Oh, um, I'm a big coffee person. I have to say, I just drink a lot of coffee in, you know, during, I, I like writing in the morning and the early part of the afternoon, and then my brain is sort of fried. So I'm, I'm a big coffee drinker when I'm writing. How about you? Uh, I like a good rye and ginger when I'm writing. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not really heavy stuff, just the rye and ginger. It, it, I would find it would kind of just relax me a little bit and I could focus yeah. on my work. I mean, uh, one drink was enough, maybe two sometimes, but uh, it would never it would never cloud my focus on what I was doing. Very nice. Uh, did you have a did you have a set number of hours a day you would write? You know, I I didn't really. Um, when I went to journalism school, one of my favorite teachers there, who became sort of a mentor, would always tell us that we should aim for like a thousand quality words a day when you're really in the writing stage of something. And um, obviously, some people write many more words than that a day that are very successful and amazing writers, and some write far fewer words. And so you kind of have to find your groove. But I think for me, once I hit that thousand-ish mark, um, it was sort. It's always Diminishing, it's diminishing returns for me after that. So I sort of close my, you know, put my laptop away and come back to it the next day because I'll, I'll just be sitting there driving my own self crazy making changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, there, there are times I've had those kind of moments too where you just realize uh, that's enough. 
And then right, exactly. you come back the next day or the day after and you have a fresh look at it. And that, that, I think that's, that's, better, that's better for you and it's better for the manuscript. Yes, yes. And I think I, what I find so helpful is getting that first draft or first you know, part down because then even when you're not working on it, you are working on it and you're whatever you're driving or running or whatever you're doing and you're, you're kind of thinking it over and making it better in your head or at least that's my experience of it. And that's hugely helpful to me rather than, than always just sitting kind of staring at the computer hoping for magic to happen. Uh, and this question, uh, this, this was one that I, I had added because it's something that uh, I've been asked by other people who uh, were interested in writing or just curious about someone who writes. And yeah, by the yeah. way, and by the way, I never, I never saw myself as a writer. I mean, when I came to Montauk, I had never written before. Wow, uh, I just, I just had a passion for learning about the lighthouse and things, all things Montauk, and it just became, it became these books. So I mean, it just, it just developed that way. But the question I get asked, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this, is that when you you're into your manuscript to a certain extent and let's say you're almost finished with it at least you think you are uh how many times have you found that when you would put the manuscript aside how many times do you revisit it and make changes how many times do you keep going back and then and then finally you reach that point when what finally tells you enough is enough that you've got what you want I can't tell you how many drafts this book went through. <laughs> I don't think my editor Jackie is on this call, but it, you know, the, the structure of this book was the hardest thing for me to figure out, the puzzle for me to figure out the order and the sequence in which to tell it. Um, and it went through so many drafts. And even, you know, on first pass pages, which is when you see it typeset and you go through it again with a red pen and then a, a second time and a third time. I mean, I could endlessly make changes to it. And, and the crazy part was that I recently read an essay of a, a highly successful author who will still make changes from her, her hardcover to her paperback. She's just endlessly improving it. And so I, I, that's a bridge too far for me personally. Now that the book is done, I don't want to read it again and, and live with it. But um, I'm a real perfectionist in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, yeah, I could, I could, writing can endlessly be improved, which is, is part of its, its wonder and its total frustration. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you reach a point where, at least this, this is just my own thought, but you have, to, you, you have to stop at some point because then you're, then you're doubting your own work too much because at some point, I think you have to have confidence in the work that you're doing. Truly, you, right. You've, yeah, you've done the important. research you've done the research, you know, you've, you've put it into words and it reads well. And even though the next day it may seem a little bit different, I mean, all right, maybe, you, maybe you tweak it a little bit, but at some point you have to trust your judgment and stop because otherwise mm -hmm. you'll never publish. Right. That's true. That's so true. The, the other thing that I do too, is that I often, when I'm writing, I read my own work aloud and there's oh. something about that where I catch, not only do I always print it out, which is another huge help um, versus editing on a screen, but it, reading it aloud is, is, a, is a game changer for me in terms of catching things that I would otherwise miss or make it, like the, the flow and the cadence of it really, really changes for me when I read it aloud. Do you, did you ever read it to say your husband, uh, just to see what he thinks? I did not read it to him, although he is uh, one of my very first readers, that's for sure. He's hugely invaluable in terms of, of, of help, yes. It's good to have somebody to bounce, the, bounce it off of. Oh, I mean, so helpful, so, so helpful, yes. Now, this, I saved this question really for the end, and I think you touched on it earlier, but I'm, I'm gonna ask it again and maybe expand on it a little bit. Uh, you said, if you could pick just one of the men aboard the wind blown to interview, uh, who would it be and why? But I would expand that a little bit. I mean, if you if you could interview all four of them, are, were there things you would want to ask them that uh, that would be you think would be significant? Well, obviously, 
you know, a lot, one one theme of this book is this relationship between fathers and sons. Um, and I don't mean to intimate that these four particular men were were out talking about their their issues with their fathers while they were longlining for tilefish. But but yeah, I would I would love to sit down with them and and you know talk with them about about what that primary bond had had done to them for better or for worse and how it, it had informed not only who they became, but but the particular work that they decided to do and and, and how that formed them. I, that's of endless fascination to me, relationships between mothers and, and, and sons and daughters and, and, and fathers, of course. So that would be interesting. I, of course, would, would love, um, since I thought of him, you know, the, probably the most uh, would be to to meet Captain Captain Mike uh, in person. I've just heard such incredible things over and over and over again from everyone who knew and loved him. So, um, yeah, I would just love to to have, have had the the privilege to have met him in the flesh. Nice. Do you have plans to visit the lighthouse in your future? I will indeed be there on July 1st. I am in conversation um, with uh, a, a local other writer by the name of Tom uh, Clavin. Who's oh, right, be, uh, he did the uh, Dark Noon book yeah. about the Pelican. Yep, and he has another book that's recently out and he's gonna talk to me um, on July 1st. So I hope that you'll stick around that evening and we can actually meet in person. That would be Oh, really I would lovely. love to meet you in person. It would be, I, I, would, I would look forward to that. Did, did actually I had a question mixed in, but I skipped over it. But did other did other Montauk wrecks shipwrecks actually cross your mind at all during the course of your research? In did terms of think, doing another story, no, not, about a, them? not as a no, not as a book. But did you think um, about the nature of some of the other wrecks, like the Pelican? I have, I have, I certainly have. Right, right. Um, you know, the Pelican was obviously, it'll be interesting to talk with Tom because his book on the Pelican, the Pelican was the, the largest and most recent loss of life between 51 when it went down um, until 84 when the four men aboard the Windblown went down. Obviously, That's far different right. circumstances. It was a party boat and these were, you know, people out going on a lovely day uh, trip, fishing boat that was overloaded and he can talk about that. Um, but but no, the similarities of, of of that culture and what drew them to the East End and and that whole that whole community, um, and that whole well, in the industry, really. yeah, yeah. Because you mentioned that in your you mentioned you had one chapter in there about the fisherman special, which was that uh, popular uh, railroad train that brought all the fishermen out. I always got a kick right. out of the fact that these guys were so anxious to get to their particular boat and their spot that the train wouldn't even stop and they'd be leaping off the boat or off the uh, train already. <laughs> yeah, I think they're very, su very uh, uh, superstitious and very consistent in their in their mannerisms. <laughs> we're fishermen. This is very true. This is all true. Right. Well, I'd like well, to I, I, uh, Thank you, Henry um, and uh, Amanda. I'd like to open the floor at the moment um, for some questions. Would you like to take a few questions from the audience? We have in the chat um, a couple of uh, questions. We have from, um, uh, let's see, we have uh, the books, the book talks about other boats coming back to Montauk and some to New England. Can you elaborate on that? Mm. I'm sorry, will you repeat that again? The book, the book talks about some other boats coming back to Montauk and some to England, New England. Yes. Can you elaborate? Yes, yes. Right. So, um, of course, I'm sorry, I was just scrolling through some of the chat. So many interesting questions. I'll let you moderate that so I don't get caught up in the technology aspect. But yes, there were, you know, book many, many, many boats were caught in the same storm, um, you know, that, 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 you know, one set out a mayday alerts, many of the men docked in Stonington for the night, um, that the inlet, you know, the Montauk inlet was, was so overwhelmed with water and rising sea levels that it was for the first time in many of these men's recollection, impassable. Um, and, and, and they weren't able to, to, to tether their docks, their boats to the dock that evening. Um, and it became sort of, a, you know, a, a kind of a timing and a judgment issue of, of how, it, how and why it was that the wind blown was still out 
and still caught, you know, in this early morning hours of the, the storm when it was really at its most fierce and ferocious um, and, 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 and caught in just a particularly awful point there between, you know, nestled in between Montauk Point and Block Island. Um, but, but yes, many, obviously all the whole, every other member of, of the fleet survived that storm that had been out in it. Um, besides these, the four crew, uh, crew members of the wind blow. We have uh, another yeah. question. What is your toughest interview or what was your toughest interview that you did with the uh, people remembering at the time? I would say um, I would say Mary and and Alice for different reasons. Um, but both of whom, when I met them, you know, the first time, um, journalists often have you know one opportunity necessarily to meet someone, and um, so each of them were were are, are complicated women in different ways. And obviously, you know, I'm asking them about. The, the, the hugest tragedy of their lives. So you can imagine that those are difficult, um, difficult conversations to have. And um, and so so yes, th those were challenging each in different ways. Uh, let's see. We have a question um, from Jim. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim, you have your hand raised. You can um, unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, ask your question. Yes. Uh, have you looked into the book Men's Lives that talked about all of the fishermen out there? Um, and also on the uh, for, yeah. Bob, uh, uh, are the uh, Shinnecock Indians who died on an attempted rescue, are they also commemorated on that monument? I will take the Men's Lives question and I will let... Okay, the, yeah, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I do mention Peter Matheson's beautiful book in mine as well, um, in a few different instances. And he actually, at the very tail end of his book, um, in, the, in the second to last chapter, he, um, he describes the windblown, uh, not in a ton of detail, but, but sort of the impact of the loss of the, he described them as these four dragger men who had gone down and how that had ricocheted through the community. Right. Uh, it's such a beautiful, I just, yeah, I love, I love men's lives. And Henry, what about the the, the uh, Shinnecocks on the memorial? Yeah, that's what I'm uh, just thinking about. Uh, the uh, The monument does not have the uh, Shinnecocks on it. Uh, it was commercial fishermen that were featured on that uh, in, in the engraving of, of the uh, monument. There is a monument in East Hampton to the uh, Okay. To, to the Shinnecocks, uh, or I should say, their individual uh, gravestones for the the Shinnecocks uh, Shinne in the uh, South End burial ground, right in East Hampton Village. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have. Let's see. Um, only we have a question. Only people who were lost at sea, whose bodies were not recovered, are on the monument. Um, whose bodies are not recovered that are on the monument? Is that right? Who's yeah? Whose bodies were not recovered but are on the monument? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah. I, oh, I oh, saying. Yeah, Mia's saying that only the people who are lost at sea whose bodies were not recovered are on the monument. So there we have. Thank you, Mia. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. That, uh, yeah, it, it, it's the monument is for people who were lost at sea. That's why they refer to it as the lost at sea monument. There is no body. No body to be recovered. And I, I do have, I've seen several questions about signed copies. Um, here on the East End, there are two lovely independent bookstores that I am a huge fan of and supporter of Sa Southampton Sag Harbor Books, which is two separate bookstores and also uh, Bookhampton and East Hampton. And they both have um, signed copies of my book. And um, there's, also there's... So they can be asked for at your local library, <laughs> better yet. So, but if you'd like a signed copy, um, they, they're available. And Burton's and Greenport also, um 
if you're on the North Fork, they uh, they have they have poppies uh, in stock, and uh, any any local any local bookstores, you know, we always like yes. to support the, the exactly. local. Exactly. You better sign one for me. <laughs> Absolutely, Henry. I'm doing. I'm as we speak. <laughs> We'll bring yours out to the lighthouse, hand delivered on the first of July. Uh, that's a deal. <laughs> Does uh, anyone else have any uh, questions for Amanda or Henry? Oh, we have uh, Jim. Yep, we can. If you don't mind me asking another one. Uh... <laughs> You talked about the idea that you, you and both of you have sort of said you felt like outsiders. When do you become an insider in Montauk? I mean, obviously, you have a lot of people now commuting out there. You have a gentrification of the community, you know. Right. Now, who were the insiders and outsiders, you know? And uh, I was just curious. I know in Maine, uh, becoming uh, somebody moved up there in the 1920s, and they're still referred as that person from Brooklyn. You know, I don't know if that's prevalent in, on Montauk as well, but. That's really funny. Um, you know, Jim, it's, it's, it's a curious thing I find on the East End, given that I'm not from this area, that, you know, I find in particular, even people that were born at Southampton Hospital don't necessarily feel comfortable saying they're from here unless their ancestors go back for several generations. Um, particularly among the Bonnikers and some of the founding families of East Hampton. I, I've noticed that um, sort of a little bit of a rivalry there, obviously. And I'm sure that it, it, it's not unrelated to the fact that this is certainly a seasonal community. And there's, right. a, but even among the, you know, which I am as well, a year round resident, um, there's still this, this odd stratification um, that someone far more knowledgeable about local history will have to explain to me. But um, I, I honestly find it, totally fascinating that people even even second generation families in East Hampton don't necessarily feel comfortable saying they're from here right so, yeah well, the, maybe the one, play that another conversation <laughs> well the ones that call themselves Bonnikers uh, they're very uh, proud and very serious of that uh, title and uh, I remember I guess it was about 10 years ago I was invited to uh, speak to uh, a group of these Bonnikers in Amagansett, uh, there were, gosh, I think there had to be about 150 of them in the room. And at that point, I mean, I had already published a couple of books. I mean, I had gotten to know a lot of people in Montauk and I made this little joke before I started my presentation about the lighthouse. And I said, well, I guess getting to know so many people out here and learning about uh, Montauk and the East End, I says, maybe I'll be considered an honorary Bonnaker. And this mm. little, little old lady sitting in the front row looked up at me and she said, you'll never be a Bonnaker. <laughs> There's an accent. <laughs> There's an accent that goes with it. And that accent is disappearing with the older generation. Because I know some, the parents had the accent, the children don't, possibly because they grew up watching television or the nature of the community has changed. You know, they've been overwhelmed by outsiders moving in, but the accent is uh, probably going to disappear within this generation. It's kind of sad because uh, you know they there are proud there are proud people out there. I mean, especially the old timers that uh, I think they relish and value their history, and I think with the change of generations there isn't there doesn't seem to be as much concern and interest as there were say when we were young uh, when you were learning about history especially local history right. uh, I, I taught years ago and I always tried to instill uh, some local history into the material because it, I think it gave more meaning to the students because they could say hey these things happened here right where I live it, it wasn't some far away place. Mm. Interesting. 
I see uh, Lynn, you have a question. You can lower uh, Yes, I'm, I'm here um, from Mattituck Library. And I, I just wanted to say that one of the most um, beautiful parts of the book was the fact that they that the different people on the boat came from such different backgrounds. Captain Mike being a local uh, family and then, you know, the other um, crew on the boat coming from, you know, a, a very different uh, background, uh, you know, from the city and the country club. And that was really what made this story so, so interesting to me, um, as well as, um, you know, the whole universal um, truth of, of people coming together to try to, you know, do a rescue, which unfortunately, you know, didn't happen. But, um, you know, that's the one thing that you find in these small towns is, you know, when tragedy strikes, it doesn't matter where you come from, everybody, you know, will work together. And I think that showed in, in the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I noticed no, I that. Absolutely. I did yeah. notice that in the book that the people in Montauk, they just uh, rallied. And uh, that's not unusual from what I've come to learn out there in these years that uh, it's a small town and when crisis happens, a lot of people drop what they do and see, first thing they wanna know is what can I do to help? Very impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think too, you know, I, I knew coming into it that, that there was a, a slight, you know, socioeconomic disparity among the men, but it became fascinating to see how it was that these four, you know, wildly divergent men of different backgrounds came to be on, on this particular boat at, in, in this particular, you know, point in time. It was also one more, one last thing, it's just such an interesting point to look at the East End, you know, that 1984 Point, which is before all the Wall Street money poured in and certainly well before the hedge fund and private equity money. And now we're seeing the, the remnants of tech money transforming this area. And, um, you know, this was this is just a, a wholly different time. I think much of it is maybe even a nostalgia that I have that that, that I wish I had, had been living here then. I, I think it, it just seems um, maybe simpler, maybe, far, you know, obviously fewer McMansions and what have you, and, and just an appreciation for, for for the history and what, and what this place means. There was a lot of old money out there before too. Don't kid yourself. You know, it was, okay. you know, <laughs> Fair enough. There were new groups coming in, but you know. Well, Henry, I look forward to continuing this conversation. It's so nice to meet you. And thank you to everyone who uh, has made time on their Friday evening to, to listen to us. This is such a pleasure. And all the librarians and, and libraries, your support means, means a great deal. I, did, I just want to mention um, that we have also participating, we have Montauk, West Hampton, Kachag, and Southhold uh, all uh, participating. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Amanda for being able to, to take the time out of a very busy schedule to do this wonderful talk. And Henry uh, Osmers uh, for conducting a, a great interview. And um, we wish you both the best in your endeavors. And just to reiterate, if you'd like a copy of uh, The Lost Boys of Montauk, there are copies available at your local bookstores out here on Long Island. Sag Harbor Books, Southampton Books, Book Hampton, and Burton's on the North Fork. And uh, I'd like to wish everybody a wonderful weekend and if you get a chance to go out to Montauk visit beautiful lighthouse and uh, maybe Henry will take you on a tour. <laughs> have my a, pleasure. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.